Hey everybody, Dr. A here, and in this video we are going to be discussing statically indeterminate beams. Now if you remember from your previous knowledge, a beam is a type of flexure member, okay? So a flexure member is one in which you have applied loads along the length of the member that causes that member to bend or flex. And a beam is just one example of a flexure member. Now, let's get to talking about statically indeterminate beams. So what we mean by that is when we have more external support reactions than applicable equilibrium equations, a beam will be called statically indeterminate, and that's gonna be due to the geometric constraints that are caused by those extra external support reactions, all right? Now, we can further say that the difference between the number of reactions and the number of applicable equilibrium equations is going to be called the degree of indeterminacy, which we typically call D sub I, all right? So let's go ahead and build a relationship here. Let's say let R equal the number of support reactions for your system. And then we're gonna say let N equal the number of parts of your system of, or of your structure. So the degree of indeterminacy is computed by saying R minus three times N. Now you may be wondering where does the three come from? Well, for a flexure, for a two-dimensional flexure uh, member, you have three applicable equilibrium equations per part. So if you have N number of parts in your system or in your structure, each part has three equilibrium equations that could be applicable. Those are some of the forces in the x direction equals zero, some of the forces in the y direction equals zero, and some of the moments about a point equals zero. So if you say R minus three N, that's gonna give you the degree in which that structure or that in this case it's gonna be a beam is gonna be statically indeterminate. So we write this down, three N is actually equal to the number of applicable equilibrium equations for your entire system. So let's go ahead and look at some simple illustrations of statically indeterminate systems and let's compute the degree of indeterminacy. So these are just gonna be some simple illustrations. Let's look at this particular illustration. So this beam right here is what we call a propped cantilever beam. So I'll write that off to the side here, propped cantilever beam. So a propped cantilever beam is one that at one of its ends, there is a fixed connection and at the opposite end, there is a roller. So it's like a cantilever beam that's being propped up on the opposite side by a roller. So instead of it being a free end here, you have a roller, okay? So let's look at this. How many parts are in this structure? Well, a part is considered to be one solid member, okay? So a part is gonna be this one single member, AB. So here we're gonna say N equals one. There's one part, all right? Now we're gonna ask the question, how many external reactions do we have in this system? Okay, well, to look at the external reactions, we could just draw a free body diagram of our system and count them up. So at A, since you have a fixed connection, you're gonna have three external reactions. You'll have an AY, an AX, and an MA reaction. And then on the opposite side at point B, you have a BY. So here we see that R equals four. We have four external support reactions. So if, again, if you look at our sentence that we wrote here, when you have more external support reactions than applicable equilibrium equations, it's gonna be statically indeterminate. And the difference between the number of reactions and the number of applicable equilibrium equations is the degree of indeterminacy. So how do we set that up? Well, we say D sub I equals R minus three N. So R is four, and then we say minus three times N, which is one and that gives us one degree of indeterminacy. So we say that this propped cantilever beam is statically indeterminate to the first degree, okay? 
So that's one illustration. Let's do another one. Let's do another illustration and uh, see what we come up with. Let's look at what's called a two-span continuous beam. So I'm going to write that off to the side. Two-span continuous beam. So a two-span continuous beam has two different spans that are separated by an external support reaction that's placed somewhere along the span. So the fact that we have this roller here that's in between these other two external reactions gives us two spans. Now, when we look at this, we wanna ask ourselves, how many parts do we have? Well, if you notice in this diagram, this one entire length of the member is one part, okay? There is nothing that this is considered one solid piece, one solid member. So we're gonna say N equals one. So even though there are two spans, but those two spans are made of one solid member, okay? So N equals one. Now we need to get the external support reactions or not get them, but identify how many we have. So. If you draw a free body diagram, again, it all goes back to a free body diagram. If you draw a free body diagram, you're gonna have a vertical and a horizontal reaction at that left support, which is a pin. You have a vertical reaction at that interior roller and another vertical reaction at that exterior roller. So we see that R equals four. You just count up those reactions and we can go ahead and calculate the degree of indeterminacy is R minus three N, which comes out to be first degree indeterminate again. So this two span continuous beam is in statically indeterminate to the first degree. All right, let's do a couple of more of these and, and uh, keep it going, keep it going. So let's look at our famous simply supported beam. So a simply supported beam is one that we see often in, in our statics and mechanics and materials courses. Simply supported beam. Okay, so how many parts do we have? Well, we have one part, we have one solid member. And how many external reactions do we have? We draw a free body diagram. We see we have a vertical and a horizontal reaction at the left support and just a vertical reaction at the right support. So we have R equals three. So what is the degree of indeterminacy? Well, we say D sub I equals R minus three N. And so we have three minus three times one, which is zero. Now, what does that mean? This, this means it's statically indeterminate to the zero degree, which means we're, we can say dot, 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 this is a statically determinate beam. All right, that makes sense, right? I mean, if your degree of indeterminacy is zero, that means it's not indeterminate. It is in fact statically determinate. And that's a type of system that we have analyzed before, right? This is statically determinate systems are what we pretty much what we always analyze in a statics course and in a lot of mechanics of materials applications. So that's actually a statically determinate beam. Let's do another one. Let's do another one. Let's say we have a beam that's fixed at one end. It has an internal hinge in uh, somewhere on, its, on, on the interior part of its length, and then it's supported by a roller at the opposite side. So this right here is called an internal hinge. Now we see problems like this, internal problems with internal hinges a lot in statics. This, in fact, is called a compound beam, okay? A compound beam is a beam that has an internal, oops, I didn't mean to erase that, that has an internal hinge that's attaching two different parts together, okay? So we see this in real life as, uh, as commonly as bolted connections. You have two beam members that are bolted together. So it's actually two pieces that are connected. So that gives us, uh, gives, gives way for us to say that N equals two here, okay? You have two parts. You have the part that is connecting the fixed connection 
with the internal hinge and then the second part is the is from the internal hinge to the roller here so how do we uh, draw a free body diagram of, of a compound beam well for a compound beam you actually if you remember from your statics you disassemble at the internal hinge so it's kind of like you take the beam apart where this internal hinge is present and what becomes visible well at the left support of course you have a vertical reaction a horizontal reaction and you have a moment reaction that's at the fixed support here we know that at the complete opposite side at the roller we have a vertical reaction we know that but what comes out of this internal hinge that we have disassembled well what comes visible here is a a vertical set of forces and a set of horizontal forces that are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So what I mean by that is you have um, this, this vertical force that becomes visible that on one side of the member, on one, one of the member uh, pieces at the internal hinge, it's pointing up. And at the same point, at the internal hinge on the other piece, it's pointing down. And then something similar is happening with the horizontal forces there, okay? Now, no moment is gonna develop here. You're not gonna have a moment that develops here because an internal hinge is free to rotate, which means it will not develop a moment reaction or an internal moment at that point. So we're gonna say R equals, and we're gonna count all of these up. We have three at the fixed support, we have two at the internal hinge, and then we have one at the roller. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Now you may be wondering, you may be saying, well, wait a second, Dr. A, I'm looking at four forces here, right? So you may be looking at this and you may be saying, well, R should equal eight. Well, that's not true. R does not equal eight, okay? I'm gonna put an exclamation point, some exclamation points here. The reason why is because these horizontal forces, even though they're showing up in opposite directions, they are the same magnitude. They both have the same magnitude. I just called it Fx. And these vertical forces, even though they're showing up in opposite directions, they have the same magnitude. I'm gonna call that Fy. So you only count what develops at the internal hinge. When, when you're counting up your R values, you only count two of them, not all four of them, okay? So here we're gonna say D sub I, D sub I is R minus three N, and that of course is gonna be six minus three times two, so that's zero, and that means that this beam is also statically determinate. Okay, and in fact, you should have analyzed uh, systems or beams like this in a statics course or maybe even a, in a mechanics of materials course at some point or another. So you have actually analyzed this as a statically determinate system in, in your previous classes or previous knowledge, okay? So, um, so let's kind of wrap this video up. Why, why is all of this important? Well, um, whenever you have these, these extra external reactions, we need more relationships to solve for them. So I'm gonna make a note here. I'm gonna say we need additional relationships to solve for the extra, or we sometimes say redundant, support reactions. What are these additional relationships gonna be called? Well, in one of our famous methods, it's called compatibility relationships, okay? Or, or the famous method is also sometimes called the force method or the redundant method in which we use these additional relationships called compatibility relationships or compatibil compatibility equations, okay? So I'm gonna say these additional relationships are called compatibility equations, 
Okay, now the number of, I'm just going to abbreviate this compat equations we need is equal to the degree of indeterminacy, is equal to that d sub i value. So that's why when you have a statically determinant system like we just saw, you don't need any compatibility relationships, right? You can solve for all the external reactions only from your equilibrium equations. But when you have something that is statically indeterminant, you need at least one compatibility relationship, but maybe more depending on just how indeterminate it is. What is the degree of indeterminacy? So if you have a system where you have uh, two degrees of indeterminacy, that means you will really, in order to fully solve that system for all of the external reactions, you will need two compatibility relationships, okay? Now, where do these compatibility relationships come from? Well, they come from relating your applied loads to displacements on the system, all right? So let's write that down. We're gonna say compatibility equations come from relating the applied loads to displacements on the system at particular locations, usually at boundaries. Okay, so um, if you've learned about compatibility equations, when, when maybe you've learned about other statically indeterminate systems, maybe you've studied statically indeterminate axial systems or statically indeterminate torque systems, um, it's a similar idea that, as that if you have learned that before. So um, that's going to conclude this video. In a follow-up video, we're going to talk in more detail about how to develop compatibility equations, and we're going to see some examples of us actually solving uh, full systems systems, fully statically indeterminate systems using compatibility equations. So that's going to conclude this video. If this was helpful, helpful to you, please hit like and subscribe.